he's been writing about this since 1994 and Mitch calls him an encyclopedia of corporate medicine. He's the chair of emergency medicine at Temple University. He's the past American Academy of Emergency Medicine president. And uh, tell us about when, when you started in emergency medicine, when you started seeing these corporate takeovers start happening in, in uh, emergency medicine. So, I mean, if you look at the arc of emergency medicine, it, it started with, uh, you know, great intentions, a moral imperative to deliver care to the, uh, the poor, the uninsured, to people that were arriving in emergency departments. But essentially, you know, as stuff started to get concentrated in the hospital, better equipment, the decline of, you know, the home visit, the ED became a, you know, an area for care. And, you know, in the mid fifties, you had these, all these, uh, we saw the show match, right? You have all these surgeons that come back from Korea and say, look, we did better care for injured patients in Korea than we're doing in the United States. So that was another part of the drive. Actually, a lot of academic emergency medicine was started by surgeons. So then, you know, you created this and then, well, look, it's really getting busy. There's, there's history articles that you can look at where the volume started to shoot up and became recognized that we need somebody who specialized in emergency medicine. You know, sort of the sad thing is, is that the way the specialty took off, there was a lot of, you know, social justice type things and tolerant, pregnant women who were poor being told to go to the county hospital. And it was almost, when you look at it, I, and I researched the history pretty, pretty well. I mean, I started my residency in 1982 and I kind of wish I had started a decade earlier to be able to, to kind of stop things before they got out of hand. But there were kind of two pathways. One, you had the, the docs at the big hospitals, the academicians that were really focused on creating a specialty to serve the needs of the patients, the poor, the uninsured. And then along the other side, you had the entrepreneurs who were realizing, hey, we can make a lot of money off emergency medicine by hiring our colleagues unprofessionally, you know, to make money for us when we're not even there seeing the patient. So while we were busy creating an academic base, you know, getting NIH funding, becoming academic departments, you know, we were censoring each other for taking pens from pharmaceutical companies. And then on this whole other track, there was this creation of an industry to exploit your colleagues, to make money off of them. And then that's morphed over time. They grew bigger. And then they sold to lay interest. The first one was an MCARE to a company called Laylaw. And then that later rolled to uh, private equity. And now we have a situation where private equity is dominant. You know, many, many emergency departments you walk into and private equity owns it. And the danger to the patients is they determine who sees you. Private equity says, mm, what's the business decision here? Is it going to be a board certified doctor or is it going to be, you know, a non-physician practitioner? You know, how can I get away with the cheapest model? So these are in companies where investors put money in. They have a, you know, a group of managers that look for opportunities where, you know, in a five to seven year period, the investors can get back, you know, a 20%, 15, 15 to 20% return on investment. In the meantime, the, the, those running the private equity firms are making money for themselves, getting healthy salaries. So private equity is basically where rich people generally put their money to try to make more money. And the, the trouble is, is they come into an industry and they create practices to make money that can have negative effects. They can shut down hospitals. You know, we saw that in Philly here with Hahnemann. There was some private equity backing there. Uh, they, they do what they can. To, it's to profit, right? Their goal is to profit when, you know, the goal for healthcare is to take care of the patient. Right. So I don't think patients understand. They think if you go to a hospital, you're being cared for by maybe an altruistic group of people that is there to take care of their health. And what I think a lot of people don't understand is now medicine has become a business or a commodity. And as a patient, you're there for healthcare, but you're actually there to make money for this system. And this system is often owned by businesses and there's uh, stocks that are traded. So I think that's the first thing that patients need to understand. I mean, do we own any responsibility for this or is this totally just the hospitals and private equity? Well, I mean, the, the problem was started by physicians, right? It was the, the physicians that saw the profit mode of those that got in and saw the, the chance to take a, advantage of others. I can tell you the original constitution and bylaws of ASAP wrote in 1968 specifically said in there that you will not take the fees of a colleague, 
that you're, you're, you know, you will earn your income from your own services to patients. It also has a line in there that you won't allow practice of medicine by a non-physician. So again, against both corporate control and also against non-physician pr- providers, you know, pr- practitioners being independent. Started out right, and the, and the docs that started it, the eight docs that formed it and wrote the bylaws were independent practice. They were people that came out of family practices and decided to get together to cover an ED. But then, you know, you've got the entrepreneurial spirits that come in and saw the opportunity. Hey, at this, I mean, actually, if you read the rate of emergency medicine, you see how it happened. Like somebody was moonlighting at a hospital and said, look, if you can get your colleagues to work, I'll give you 10 bucks an hour for every hour you cover with that. And it just, they just saw the profit motive. One of them quit their residency just to go into ED staffing and it grew and grew. And then they actually said, let's rise the power. And they changed the bylaws of the ASAP. You know, there wouldn't be anything, any barrier. The academicians who should have been watching the shop were too busy, you know, trying to create journals and research and, and, and that stuff. And the moral force of the academics was not brought to bear on the American College of Emergency Physicians. And essentially, they created a system where they shut off debate. I can actually sh- show you a letter to the editor where they said, we are not going to discuss this stuff in the journals. They, they shut off the press to, to suppress debate. And then, you know, the book was published, The Rape of Emergency Medicine, brought a new generation, you know, myself and others say, wait a second, this is going on. Once you, you know, lifted the lid, you could see that it was pretty clear there were abuses going on when we let our residents go out into the world. That's how I got involved. I was a program director. And I said, this is wrong. I mean, this, this world is not right where they're being taken advantage of. Wall Street type contract management groups now control and employ a large number of physicians staffing emergency departments and doctors have begun to be influenced or coerced or threatened if they don't comply or they don't, uh, you know, charge X amount of dollars that they can actually be fired or lose their contract. It's been shown. All right. So, I mean, if the listeners, you know, they can go search on a 60 minute show called The Cost of Admission by Steve Croft. It was done in 2013. And there, you know, HMA hospitals for profit chain colluded with Envision MCare to basically force doctors to admit to a, a quota. If you were over 65 and you came in, they expected a 50% admission rate. Otherwise, you would be threatened with your job or fired. So this is an example of the, the bean counters trying to press you to be more profitable. You know, we see the same thing with the non-physician practitioners. You know, don't interfere. Don't try to supervise. You've got to supervise them but don't interfere, let them operate independently. We hear these stories all the time as the American Academy of Emergency Medicine. So it's the profit motive. Another topic is the corporate practice of medicine. In most states, there exists laws to say businesses can't employ physicians. There's the same thing exists for lawyers. You don't want the business interest between the patient and the doctor. You don't want the business interest between the lawyer and the client. Yet in medicine, these have not been enforced they have scams to get around them, and it's sorely needed. I mean, this is something that I've been advocating for for a long time. I think we're starting to wake up to this with what's going down and with private equity being more aggressive. The pandemic brought it out. Doctors that are risking their lives, getting pay cuts in the middle of the pandemic. People are starting to say, wait, why, why is that You know, Wall Street company determining staffing levels here? So it's an opportunity for anyone listening, for the public, for, for doctors themselves to, to step back and say, why do we have private equity involved in medicine? Well, and what do we do about it? I guess that's my question. Once they have you in your clutches, like what is, what's the solution to reverse the trend? Well, it's to try to get all physician organizations to use the existing prohibitions out there to take back medicine. I mean, that's... Mitch and I are part of the Take EM Back. So in, in a lot of the big states, in the home state of Envision, MCARE, Texas, there is very strong prohibitions on corporations practicing medicine. They use doctors as paper owners to create sham professional associations. This was all discussed in a ProPublica article. I don't know if you saw that, where the, the doctor who's the owner has no idea of the finances, all profits are swept. So getting organized medicine to deal with the attorney general's office. This is the illegal corporate practice of medicine, filing suit. Okay, now the American Academy has filed suit four times against corporate groups. We need to do it more. 
Uh, we won three of those four cases. In the fourth one, we just didn't get standing. Uh, fee splitting, that's another rule, okay? So technically, you know, you're paying a part of your fee for the right to see patients in the emergency department. Again, in every state, that's, that's prohib prohibited. Got to bring that to light. Um, you were aware of some federal, you know, false claims actions on some of this kind of stuff, but it's really, it's got to collectively come from organized medicine. Um, you know, the AAEM is the smaller of the groups. I think we've successively proven that you can do something. Of course, we've filed suit four times. We've been defending doctors left and right who, who get fired. We've been writing to hospital administrators, you know, don't replace the physician owned group with a corporation. This will be a problem. Advocating, trying to take EM back and other specialties are just as bad as we are now. I think we started it. And then, you know, they morphed out into radiology, anesthesia, private equities in the urology, GI. It's it's just becoming rampant because they say, hey, we made a lot of money on emergency medicine. Like dermatology, those guys make a lot of money. We can really wreak in a profit there. So the emergency doctors, we're there 24-7. We're there on the holidays. We work night shifts. It's extremely stressful. We see young children die. You know, where I work, I see 16-year-old kids shot and killed. Dealing with the mom, it's just, you know, it, it just tears at your soul. But now you have created within the specialty a feeling of exploitation. That So first off, the doctors have no idea what's being billed and paid in their name. So they're in the dark. You know, lack of transparency breeds distrust. They see the displays of wealth that are out there with these companies. They host giant receptions. We hear leaders who are doing quite well. You know, you know, one leader of one of these large groups got a, a tower at the Ohio State football stadium named after him. It's just, and you, you feel like here I am doing a difficult job and I'm being exploited. So that's, that's really like the core reason I'm involved being, you know, an academician training residents because I don't think you can do a difficult job if you feel somebody's being take, taken advantage of you. And then you take it to the patient level. If your doctor feels exploited, burned out, they're not going to deliver the best care. They're not in the right frame of mind. It affects the doctor. It affects the patient care. And then the patients on the other end are getting these excessive bills. Doctors have no idea what the charge master is. And then they get pursued. So it's, it's a, it just doesn't make any sense that you can't have private equity in emergency medicine. What has the ASAP done about corporate practice? And the answer is absolutely nothing. Unfortunately, now they have the opportunity to do something. I actually rejoined them and put a couple of resolutions forward at the national council meeting to create what's called transparency and to guarantee emergency physicians due process. I mean, those are the two linchpins of the industry. One is the doctors have no idea what's being built and paid in their name. So they can make as much money as they can. They can send out as high as the bill. And then if you complain about it, they can fire you. If you complain about staffing issues, like, wait a second, you're giving me too many NPPs to supervise. Well, we'll just get somebody else to work for you. And did you read your contract? We can get rid of you tomorrow. If you complain about the quality of care, the stories that you know we hear, they're just unbelievable. Would really shock the public. Some of them got out. Uh, you know, advocating for PPE, for patient safety during COVID. I'm dealing with seven different docs right now who've been terminated. And the reasons are, are crazy. You know, one doctor, they, uh, you know, COVID surge happened. They cut staff. Now the volumes are up, complained that we don't have enough coverage. All right, you're out of here. We'll get somebody else. The most expensive piece of the equation is what they pay the doctor. So the more you can replace the expensive doctor with a cheaper provider, the better it is. But as you know, you know in your book, and you know from physician for patient protection, you know the sore throat could be devastating. It could be epiglottitis. The the kid with the flu could have sepsis. It's the way it is. We have our fire departments standing there ready to take care of fires, but a fire doesn't happen every day. But when they do, you know you you want professionals to respond. So replacing the the highest level of education, the board certified emergency physician with people that aren't trained in emergency medicine and let alone people that aren't even physicians creates a danger to patients. And it's, it's right there in the cold corporate slideshow that we want to use the cheapest provider available to get the mission done. And the patients, they, they don't know that. The patients walk in and a lot of times they're deceived. They think they're seeing a doctor, 
or do you think there's a doctor in charge? And that's not always the case. You know, doctor training, you know, you can put up the graphic, the hours and hours and hours that we have to, you know, endure patient care, supervise the amount of contact hours. There's just no comparison. You know, the patients deserve the best. I mean, the first line of the mission statement of the academy is every patient deserves access to a specialist in emergency medicine defined as board certified doctors. And we're seeing less and less of that because the, the business interest doesn't want it. I tell you, I talk to patients about this all the time. You want to come to the, I mean, we're a tertiary medical center. You know, you, you want the opportunity to see a physician if at all possible. So I think we ought to you can't be an emergency department. You can't call yourself emergency unless there's a doctor present. You know, you know, as well as I do, that there are places where there's no doctor and it says emergency. Now, what, how deceptive is that? I mean, academic docs got to get involved. Like in emergency medicine, I've been trying to convince my colleagues that you have a responsibility to your graduates to, to create a better community for them to where they go out and practice and uh, unfortunately, some have stepped up, but the majority are just buried in their own academic world. It's going to haunt them because I think we're going to see a decrease in the appeal of EM to medical students. It's already happening. Uh, and then they're going to say, why didn't my residency fill with those Ivy League graduates? Well, because you let the specialty slide to a corporate interest. In its purest form, physician-led emergency practice is one of the greatest forms of medicine out there. I mean, it is, you know, you talk to physicians in physician-owned groups who work for themselves, they work for the hospital, they work for the patients. I mean, that is a beautiful form of practice. I mean, these are doctors that are dedicated to the patients and, you know, it's a great specialty. I mean, you get to save lives, you get to make a difference. Um, and there's, you know, there's a good feeling for taking care of the poor patients, getting the homeless guy a sandwich, doing a nice job on a laceration, saving somebody. So in its purest form, it's a great specialty. It's, you know, we let the, the economic interest, the money changers into the temple. I mean, we allowed this for profit motive to really stain the specialty. It's, you know, it's almost a sacred place. Uh, look, I love what I, my career has been great. Uh, you know, I got a shift tomorrow morning. I worked yesterday. Uh, we do great things. And the House of Medicine appreciates you, your colleagues, and other specialties have learned to rely on emergency medicine. Uh, we've become leaders across the board, deans. We've become CEOs of hospitals, chief medical officers. So it's unfortunate that we've allowed this to happen because it could be a great specialty.